Hello and welcome. We are the Archive. I'm team lead Richard Cruz Silva. We had John Hurley as our advisor, liaisons Dr. Cynthia Wang and Zachary Vernon, UX designer Dulce Villanueva, as well as our communications team consisting of Melia Andrea Garcia, Ashanti McFarland, Cassandra Terminal, and Mark Gay Limitainen. To go over our agenda real quickly, we'll be talking about the introduction and background of our project, some of the project technologies that we've hit, We'll be go going over the major project requirements, as well as some of the project challenges that we've faced. And then we'll show off a little demonstration, as well as talking about future goals that future teams might want to implement. The Archive is a social media website and mobile app for the LGBTQ community. It's a platform to document their stories and experiences, as well as share their resources. It's location-based pins that document stories on the world map, and stories can be categorized as personal, resource, or historical. We were founded in 2014 by Dr. Cynthia Wang, Assistant Professor here in the Department of Communication Studies. She was later joined by Zachary Vernon, an Assistant Professor of Art in the Graphic Design and Visual Communication Department in 2019. It was a web application that was started as a senior design project last year. So further in the background, we have an archive of past and present movements, personal experiences, and resources and organizations. It gives the LGBTQ plus community an opportunity to map out their stories, as well as giving them a place in the world and in history. As Dr. Cynthia Wang once said, by sharing stories, we can give each other hope. We are very fortunate to have been able to collaborate with other students of other disciplines, such as our UX designer and our communications team. They provide us with the necessary visual guidelines and cues on which to base our decisions, and, and they help make sure everything follows a consistent language. Passing it on to Carlos. Hi everyone, my name is Carlos and I'll be talking about project technologies. Uh, so of course, this being a continuing project, we inherited some as well as added some new technologies. One of the big ones that we inherited was the Django REST framework, that is a Python toolkit for building uh, powerful and customizable web APIs. And that serves our website, which is written in React, a JavaScript library that was created by Facebook. And all of the data is being stored on a PostgreSQL database, a general purpose relational system. And that is being hosted on a server uh, on DigitalOcean. As for the new technologies, we ended up adding Expo, which is a tool set that builds around React Native. We also added Node and Express a JavaScript API framework that is pretty commonly used, and also Docker to containerize that framework and be able to deploy it quickly on any server that supports it. Um, in our case, we're using Linode for that because it's pretty much just drag and drop. We also ended up adding MongoDB, a document database system that stores data similar to JSON, as well as we did a little bit of machine learning with scikit-learn. So here I'll talk a little bit about uh, some models. Uh, specifically the user model, I'll call it a schema. Um, as you can see, it contains some necessary fields and behaviors to store the data, uh, specifically the users you're following, uh, the push tokens, and the notifications that you've been sent. Um, and this helps serve as a single source of data, and you can see that it's defined in JSON. Now on to some serializers. Uh, serializers' job is to convert JSON into BSON, which is a format that MongoDB requires uh, the data to be saved in. Um, and what serializers also do is ensure that data being supplied is correctly formatted. Um, this is, and if it's not correctly formatted, it will help provide developers with error messages as it's needed. Um, you can see on the top, we have a creation um, endpoint, and this really just creates the, the user in the MongoDB uh, document. Um, and we also have another one on the bottom for notifying users. Um, this will initialize a notification, send it off to Expo, to the Expo servers, so that Expo can handle that, as well as store it on our own server. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about project requirements. Uh, of course, this year, the biggest one was the mobile application. It needed to be on both iOS and Android, and it also had to provide the same feature set as the current website does. Um, to do that, we ended up using Expo, which, as I said earlier, is a tool set that builds around React Native. Um, it allows us to develop, deploy, and test applications relatively quickly. All we really have to do is scan a QR code um, on our phone, and we're good to go. And of course, this is written in JavaScript. And with that, I will hand off the presentation to Evelyn. 
So my name is Evelyn and I'll be going over the app search function, starting off with the old version and making our way to the upgraded version we are currently working on. So this was a very bare bones version that included UI components such as a search bar provided by React Native Elements and React Native Vector icons, as well as a scrollable flat list that was used to display the search results. It also contained a basic search filter function that would allow us to search through the current stories list. To do so, it would compare input text with data in the stories list, the data being story titles, and then it would create a new data source of those matches and re-render our flat list to show the filtered results. Now on to our current version being worked on. We have some major design changes as well as some added functionalities. To start off, we still search through all stories. However, there is an open possibility to integrate a filter search by category. Currently, we do have that function coded and completed. However, it needs to be further polished as there is a bug where the function is only activated after the on press is triggered twice. So for the purpose of presenting a more put together application, it was omitted for now. Next, we have a view component that houses category buttons. There are currently four category buttons. They are resources, historical, personal, and all. They filter the story pins on the map to the selected category stories. And lastly, we have upgraded the navigation from the search results to the selected story screen. On this screen, you can see the selected stories corresponding color, title, description, etc. As well as any comments left on the stories. You also have the option to leave a comment yourself. To exit, you simply swipe right or press the map icon on the navigation bar below. Here we have some images to show the category button selection output. You can toggle between the category story pins. From the left to the right, we have the all, personal, historical, and then resources selected. The selection is indicated by the change in font weight and the orange bar underneath. The last item is the custom icon font. There are multiple icon sets from readily available icon fonts online, but in our case, we created our own custom icon font. To do so, we use the Icomoon app, which is just one of the many methods to do so. On the site, we uploaded a folder of SVG images provided by our UX designer and then generated a font from them. After downloading that folder, we then imported files from the folder into the project. The two important files needed are the ones with the file extensions TTF and JSON, TTF being the true type format. Then we created the function create icon set from Icomoon, which creates a custom font scent that we regularly update with design improved icons. And now I'll pass it off to the next presenter. Hello everyone, my name is Cassandra Pahad and I'll be talking about the login function and its importance to the mobile application. The login function was one of the main aspects we wanted to bring over to the Archives mobile app because this feature highlights the anonymity that the app has to offer. Unregistered users would still be able to use the app anonymously and would know that they're anonymous because they'd be welcomed with a darker map as we can see in the first screenshot. Those same anonymous users would also have the option to register for a new account if they wanted to. We also made the app so that registered users can use their existing accounts from the web application to log into the mobile app. This is distinctive because once they log in, they're welcomed with a lighter map as we can see in the middle screenshot. Lastly, we want to highlight that users with an account do have access to more features which I will go over in the next couple slides. Upon opening the mobile app, everyone is an anonymous user. This is an overview of what an anonymous user would see. If we take a look at the bottom tabs in the screenshots, we can see that anonymous users are very limited to what they can do. In the first tab, they're able to explore existing stories and leave comments on them if they wish. The middle tab is where they can post their own anonymous stories, and the third tab, which is the profile button, redirects them to a page where they can either log in if they already have an account or register for a new one. Shown in these screenshots is an overview of what a logged in user would see. As you can see in the bottom tab, they have access to more features, such as posting their own stories either publicly or anonymously, as seen in the second screenshot, bookmarking their favorite stories and following other users, as seen in the third screenshot, receiving notifications, and as seen in the last two screenshots, they have their own profile to display the stories they've posted, while also having the option to edit their profile. When building the mobile app, we also wanted to replicate these two important features from the web application, which included the search function and the login function.
With the search function, we wanted to allow users to search stories by categories, which included personal, resources, and historical stories. And as for the login function, we wanted to allow unregistered users to create new accounts and allow logged in users to optionally post anonymous stories, which ultimately we were able to do. Now we will move on to content moderation presented by Abram. Hello, my name is Abram Flores, and I'll be talking about the automated content moderation part for project. Internally, we refer to this as the ACM. The ACM is responsible for filtering out unwanted content within the archive, and the archive is an anonymous form which anybody with access to the site can post on, and thus is vulnerable to spam bots or solicitation of drugs and or unwanted sexual content, and it's going to have to be filtered out. The focus of this module is a machine learning algorithm uh, that will be used to update itself over time and remove posts that are unwanted. Um, the way it removes these posts is by a flagging system in which within the database it will flag a post and it will be moved to a separate um, list of posts which can then be viewed from an admin or moderator site or tab within the website and then be removed or approved. Um, and this is run via the management tab of the archive if you are, again, an admin or a moderator. Um, this feature is being pushed back to future teams to be implemented, but there is a uh, proof of concept algorithm and within the back end structure of the code, we is completely ready to be implemented, meaning that it is able to flag post when told. And um, we currently have a randomization, randomization um, code sample that will, when the ACM is run, it will flag post randomly and then we can approve or deny those posts. So the way that the proof of concept uh, code for the content moderation works is it takes in data from a predetermined corpus to create a dictionary with a word count. And then using those, it creates labels and feature vectors and then passes those off to a naive Bayesian classifier to learn how to read the input. Um, essentially what this does is it looks for words that are not used as much as other words and relates those to words that are close to it. And if it sees um, words that are not commonly used, it will start to raise a suspicion uh, probability. And then at the end, it will weigh uh, the probability that it is suspicious versus whether or not it is not suspicious. We also plan to implement a punishment and reward system for correct and incorrect flags, which will be uh, enforced via the admins when they approve or disapprove posts. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, an admin or a moderator uh, has a run ACM button within their management tab, and that's how the, the application is supposed to be run. Hi, my name is Brandon, and I'm going to be talking about the implementation of the privacy node. So some of the requirements include that the privacy node must act as an in-between for the actual server and the user. It must obfuscate any traffic, which means that it has to act like a Tor node before the clear web. And uh, it must be rapidly deployable. For the privacy node, we wanted to make something that would help obfuscate any traffic to the actual archive server, which means it makes the server more secure by rendering it more obscure, so it's harder to tamper with. This is important because it could be possible that a user is trying to post something like a story or anything like that from a country or region that has tight rules regarding LGBTQ plus status and we want the users to feel safe and secure when posting. We chose to use different hosting to make it more complex to hack, as well as using Docker, which is another deployment tool to quickly and securely deploy <clears throat> this node to other providers if needed. With the two combined, we have a better sense of security for the app. So all we have to do is redeploy and make a quick app update for the users. Thanks, I'll pass it on to the next presenter. 
Redux works by acting as a central store for any data that the application might need. For example, in one screen of our application, we might need our profile information, so we tell Redux to go fetch it, and when it is done, to give it to that screen. Down the line, we might need that information in another screen, and since it's already stored, we can choose to refresh it or use what we already have. One thing it helps reduce is code duplication. You don't have to write HTTP requests, the error handling, and then make sure that the code is up to date. You just modify it in one place and it works everywhere. Security. Security is very important, especially for a website catering to a vulnerable group. We need to make sure information is secure, as it could potentially be used to harm our LGBTQ plus users, especially in countries where their identities are illegal and could potentially get them killed. For this reason, we decide to use SSH authentication keys for admins and devs, and encrypted passwords for all normal users on the archive website, and we will do our best to implement more security features in the future for the sake of our vulnerable users. This is a data flow diagram showcasing the data flowing to and from users in the archive app. It includes basic functions like adding, editing, and deleting what you've written, as well as the ability to save and write stories written into the app and basic flagging options in case of inflammatory content. We hope to achieve the basic level of functionality and more to ensure a simple and welcoming experience for LGBTQ users. Hi there, my name is Bala Carter, and I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about some of the challenges we faced with this project throughout the year. Before I get into it, I wanna make sure to give credit to last year's students for handing us off a great, fully featured website and a working backend. That being said, some of the challenges we initially faced were caused by limited documentation, specifically finding the project API keys, as well as having limited documentation on setting up our local development environments and how to deploy changes to the website. We also didn't have documentation on the API endpoints and when and how to use them. There were also a couple of bugs in the front end and the back end that we had to tackle before deployment. We also struggled to have a line of communication with last year's students to help us with these problems. This was made harder by scheduling between our school and their jobs, which is to be expected. The challenges we faced in development were due to the environment setup being complicated and using a lot of technologies that we hadn't seen before. We also had to figure out how to replicate the environment setup on the deployment server. There were bug fixes that we had to hunt down that were in the production site, but came from us being handed a slightly outdated repo. These problems gave us the opportunity to create a new and more thorough setup guide that will hopefully help next students as well. We implemented a new pipeline, a new deployment pipeline, that allowed us to use an advanced version control procedure, as well as redundancy checks or code review on GitHub, which made sure we were all on the same page and that our production pushes were working. GitHub's issue tracker came in handy as well with helping us report and collaborate on fixing the bugs I mentioned previously. Upon opening the archive application, you'll be greeted with a map view. Here, we can choose to tap on a cluster to zoom in, and you can also tap on a pin to open up a story. If you want, you can filter by personal, historical, and resource categories to see different types of stories. You can choose to post, or you can go ahead and log in, which is what we will do right now. And we'll give the map a little bit to load. So you can see that my screen is still dark. However, I am in an, ano in anonymous mode. Let's go ahead and toggle that off, and we'll see that the map changed to light to indicate that we are no longer in, in anonymous mode. And if we choose to, we could go back and toggle it on. But we still retain all the same functionality, such as filtering, and zooming in, and tapping on clusters. We have also gained access to the Bookmarks tab. Here, we can see our bookmark stories. Uh, we can also see our bookmark users. You can see Nate has two stories. Both of them appear to be tests. We can choose to post, view our notifications, and of course we can see our own profile. Here we can toggle our stories as either anonymous or not. We can also view our different types of stories. We can choose to edit our own profile. And we also have access to help and hotline support us, contact us, and the ability to log out and toggle privacy mode. 
As for the future goals of the archive project, there are a couple of them listed here on this slide. The automated content moderation is just as we described earlier, using machine learning to flag posts. We've laid some of the groundwork for it, but it appears as though future teams are going to have to make use of that, since we don't have enough time to fully implement it because we're prioritizing mobile app development instead. And the batch system will also have to be completed by a future team. It's an idea we've been cooking for a while now, where the idea is to basically gamify the archive. We might hand out badges or rewards for, for participating in certain tasks on the site. In this way, it might increase activity, encourage users to post more stories, or to just explore and use the site some more. And the mobile app, it could also be improved upon as well. As we are right now, the mobile app is slated to have only the core working functionality uh, that the main site has. In the future, the app could contain additional features such as local anonymous bookmarking or push notifications, for example. Uh, the app is very new, so it might not be as robust and stable as the main website. So that's also something that we're looking to improve on in the future, the stability and the robustness of the mobile app. And I think those are pretty much it for the future goals of the archive project.